Good morning, everybody. Let us pray. O blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, who after thy glorious resurrection didst institute holy baptism, we thank thee that through this sacrament thou didst make and take us into thine arms and make us thine own in time and in eternity. Grant that we may realize more and more what heavenly gifts were by that holy washing bestowed upon us, the forgiveness of all our sins, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the assurance of eternal life. Let this sacrament be a comfort to us in sorrow, a shield in temptation, a tower of strength in weakness and doubt, a water of refreshing on the narrow way to heaven. As thou wilt not set aside the covenant made with us, grant that we may not reject it through unbelief or willful sinning, but remain faithful unto death, and in the end receive the crown of life. Hear us for the sake of thy love. And as we enter into our Bible study this morning, our thoughts go with our president and his wife, and all others who are afflicted in this pandemic. We pray for quick and speedy healing that your blessing may abide with them in this time of affliction. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Acts chapter 20. We are almost ready to get into the book of Ephesians. But it's always important when you read uh, one of the epistles, if it's possible, to kind of connect up where it is in the history of the early church, and that's what the Acts of the Apostles is. And, uh, and so, this is the background, the historical background of Paul's ministry. Remember that at the end of his second missionary journey, he stopped in Ephesus, left Priscilla and Aquila there, and went to Israel. Right? Then, on his third missionary journey, he returned, and as we read last week, he had an overwhelmingly successful missionary stay in the city of Ephesus, so much so that the entire region of Asia was affected uh, by this, and churches were established not only in the city of Ephesus, but all throughout Asia. Paul then, after almost three years of ministry among the Ephesians, he decided to go and go up into Macedonia and down into Greece. Uh, and to revisit the churches that he had established in Greece and Macedonia. And then, on his way to Jerusalem from Corinth, he stops in, uh, he, he stops in Ephesus briefly, or I should say in Miletus, and there he calls for the elders of the Ephesian church. And that's what we are going to read today. So it, Miletus is a small town that is not very far away from Ephesus. And so Paul stops there and, and brings together all of the pastors of the church in Ephesus. Uh, he called the elders of the church. So in Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, 
after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the laying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now, Paul is not looking for praise. He's not recounting his service among them in order that they will praise him. He's not looking for, you did a great job, buddy. What he is doing as he has gathered the elders together is he is encouraging them to take note of how he conducted himself when he was among them so that they will conduct themselves in the same way. He's using his example in order to encourage the same thing among the pastors who are now continuing the work that was begun under his ministry. And so he, he talks about the fact that uh, he had conducted himself in humility of mind, that he, he, he dealt with many temptations, especially he refers here to the lying in wait of the Jews. Remember, he initially went into a, con a, syn a synagogue of the Jews and that a number of people were brought from the synagogue into the church. Those who did not convert to the Christian faith became one of the chief opponents to Paul's work. And this is typical of all the cities that he went to, whether it's in Galatia or whether it's in Macedonia or Corinth, Paul would always, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, he would always go into the synagogue, preach Christ in the synagogue, and then most of the people in the synagogue would reject his gospel, but there would be some who would receive it, and they would form the nucleus of a Christian congregation. And so Paul had a Christian congregation that had a number of Jewish Christian converts, all right, and then a lot of Gentiles, a lot of people from the city of Ephesus and the surrounding uh, regions. And just like in the cities of Macedonia and Corinth, the Jews persecuted Paul for his preaching of the gospel, so it also happened in the city of Ephesus. And he particularly mentions the opposition of the Jews. And when he says the lying in wait of the Jews in verse 19, he's talking about their plot to kill him. All right, They were going to murder him. All right? uh, and he, he reminds them that he... He taught them publicly and from house to house everything that was profitable to them. He didn't hold back. He didn't only tell the happy stuff. You know, that's, that's a trick of the modern world. A trick of the modern world is to say only the happy stuff, the lighthearted stuff, to bring people into the church by basically uh, highlighting all the stuff that is positive and happy and not mentioning all the stuff about the judgment of God. You know, one of the things that we see in churches today 
is that there is virtually no real preaching of the law. I know. There's a lot of preaching of the law in we Christians ought to do this and we Christians ought to do that. There's loads of that kind of preaching of the law. But the central reason for God's giving of the law is to show us our sin. And that kind of preaching is not common in the world of Christianity today, where we, where we show everyone, Christians and non-Christians alike, the severity of God's law that they may see their sin become alarmed by their sinful condition and their lost condition, repent of their sins, and believe the gospel. Notice how he says in verse 21, testifying both to Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He talk, he's talking about the preaching of the law, the chief point of which is to show us our sin, and the preaching of the gospel, which is to show us our Savior. And so testifying in verse 21 to the law of God which reveals sin and works contrition in our hearts, and the gospel by which the Spirit works faith in our hearts. All right, now in verse 22, in verse 22 he says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. There is a necessity for him to go to Jerusalem. He feels it inside of himself. Uh, he says, I go bound in the Spirit. I've got to do this. Not knowing the things that shall befall me there. I don't know what's going to happen. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. So every place I go, people are saying, if you go to Jerusalem, you will end up in chains and you will end up under many afflictions. And then in verse 24 he says, but none of these things move me. All right? I'm not, I'm not frightened by bonds and afflictions. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Right? I don't count my life dear. So that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So he says, my purpose in life is to fulfill the ministry to which Christ has called me. And therefore, I want to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That's why I'm here. All right? So I'm not afraid of what anyone can do to me. I don't count my life dear that I have to preserve it at all costs. So then he goes in verse 25, And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. This is the last time that in this world that we are going to be together. All right? And uh, wherefore, verse 26, Wherefore I take you to record this day, that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. All right, so he says, 
There's nobody who can say that they did not hear the whole counsel of God. That is, all of the teachings of God's Word. Not only the surface and happy things, but also the deep and troubling things. I didn't hold back anything like the heretics and the cultists do. You know, when the cultists come and knock on your door and they want to get invited into your house, they will only emphasize the, the stuff that they perceive is going to be compelling to you. They won't tell you the whole story of who they are and what they really believe. You know, it's not until you get into and become a member of the cult that all of the shocking and crazy things that these cults believe in are slowly brought to your attention. But now you've already jumped in and you've already left the Christian faith and become part of a cult and so you're, you're strongly motivated because we hate, to, we hate to admit that we were wrong. And so we make a big mistake and we're stuck in it. And that's when the cultists begin to teach you all of those crazy things that if you had listened when your true pastor had taught you these things, you would have said, oh my goodness, what am I getting involved in? And so Paul here says, I am free from the blood of all men because I have not shunned to proclaim the whole counsel of God. I've preached the stuff that you liked. I've preached the stuff that you didn't like. I preached stuff that I thought to myself when I was preparing it. This is a little bit tough. This is a little bit hard. But, he says, I preached it all. I told you the whole truth. And that's an important thing for us to know. Not only that our pastors preach the whole counsel of God, but that we receive the whole counsel of God. You know, there's, there's a saying in our modern culture called the customer is always right, right? And the whole idea about selling something, offering a product is that you put, you put a premium upon the customer. The customer is always right. Now, of course, it's not true that the customer is always right, but that's a sales gimmick, all right? That's a sales gimmick. The church must never buy into that, all right? The church, the only thing that is always right is the Word of God. Pastors can be wrong. Lay people can be wrong. We can make many mistakes when we stray from the Word of God. So we have to leave that, that idea that the customer is always right. We need to leave that outside the door of the church because in the church, right, the Word of God is always right. And those who cling to the Word of God are right. And those who dismiss the Word of God despise it and willfully remain ignorant of it are in the wrong. All right? So the whole counsel of God is very important. We must realize that even the things when we read them in the Bible and our flesh is shocked by what we read. We must always remember that the whole Bible 
Every word of it is the word of God. And therefore, we must receive it and receive its teachings and uh, deal with our own flesh, which often quails at these things. All right, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. All right, he says, so watch yourself. He's talking to pastors here. Take heed to yourself and to the flock, the whole flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. The Greek word for overseers is episkopos, where we get the word bishop. Bishop, all right? Episkopos. And uh, so he says, he says, the Holy Ghost has made you bishops over the flock. And he says, take heed that you feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, notice here something, a number of things very interesting. Number one, feed the church of God means to preach the word to the church of God. It doesn't mean to open up a soup kitchen. I mean, that may happen. But when he says feed the church of God, he's talking about what do people need? They need the knowledge of God. They need faith in Christ. They need their faith increased and their knowledge and their wisdom increased. And the only way that can happen is by using the word of the Lord. And so, he says, take heed to yourselves to feed the church of God. And then, notice this, which he, who is he? Well, a few, ver a few words back, God, right? Which he, God, hath purchased with his own blood. The blood of God. The blood of Christ is the blood of God. And so here we see a testimony to the divinity of Christ. Right? The divinity of Christ and the triunity of the Godhead. The Trinity. Because Christ's blood, which He shed on the cross, is God's blood. And therefore, this is a testimony. And, and this is the thing that many people miss. You know, it's not only a matter of certain key verses where the Bible clearly says that Jesus is God or that the Bible clearly says that God is a trinity. But there are little, little verses tucked all over the place which affirm that very truth. And so you could read, right, you could read verse 28 and skip right over and go, Feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And... And you could just move on to the next verse without realizing that you have just been zapped with a highly Christological and highly Trinitarian verse of Scripture. It says that God purchased the church with His own blood. And he's referring to the blood of Christ but he calls it God's blood. That's very important. That's very important for you to see. So the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the deity of Christ are not only taught in Matthew 28 and in uh, John chapter uh, 3 and John chapter 8, etc., but very clearly sprinkled throughout. It is the... It is the it is the gospel assumption of all the apostles that the Trinity is the doctrine of God and that uh, the deity of Christ the Christ is the Christology of the church. So, 
Yes, purchased with his own blood. That's, that's one of those little passages that if you underline in your Bible, that's one to underline and put a star next to. Verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. What's he talking about? He's talking about false teachers, whom he calls grievous wolves. All right, that's, it's very important to notice here that he's not talking about government officials who come in and confiscate your furniture. All right, he's talking about false teachers who masquerade as sheep of God, but they are wolves in sheep's clothing, and they come in, grievous wolves, not sparing the flock. They preach a false gospel that draws the, the people of God away from the truth, away from the soundness of Christ, and puts them in the clutches of the devil. All right? And so he says, grievous wolves shall enter in. That's why it's so important to feed the flock of God, to preach the whole counsel of God. Because grievous wolves, after my departing, shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, and not only this, but also in verse 30, of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. What he's talking about here is that even within the Christian congregation, there are people who have for considerable periods of time been among the faithful and they will get a, her a heretical idea in their heads and they will begin to share that heresy within the congregation and form a little uh, inner congregation sect. And this little sect of false believers who are led by someone from your own selves who rises up and becomes a false teacher, right? these people will work against the true teachers of the Word of God. They will work against the true believers of the congregation and they will do everything that they can to take over. You know, in America, we have watched in the past 150 years as virtually every Christian Protestant denomination has gone from being faithful to its confession of faith to being an apostate nest of heretical bees. All right? Most of the churches that we call mainline churches are apostate today. The Word of God is not taught among such people. Only a very watered down and corrupted form of God's Word is taught. The lone exception, and I don't say this boasting at all, the lone exception to the rule, the historical rule that we've observed since the middle of the 1800s all the way up into the present is, by God's grace alone, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Because it had a nest of bees uh, back in the 50s and 60s who wanted to bring change into the, the synod. And they wanted to bring a new breath of fresh air, they said, into the synod. And so they began to take over the institutions of the synod. 
they began to get themselves in prime positions getting ready for a takeover. But by God's grace, the lay people and the pastors of the churches of the Missouri Synod became alarmed at what they saw happening and the only denomination in American history that turned back a liberal takeover was successful. And the Missouri Synod to this day, despite all of its problems, the Missouri Synod to this day is an orthodox confessional Lutheran church and we can rejoice to be a part of it even while we pray for uh, a, a redress of certain tendencies that we see within it. We nevertheless rejoice that we are able to be part of a, of a denomination that confesses the Lutheran faith without compromise. All right, so, uh, so wolves shall come from the outside in, and from your own selves men shall arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now, you know how it is in churches. People, if a pastor talks too much about the troubles and the problems, people get impatient. Oh, he's always talking about the problems and heresies and false teachers. Uh, why doesn't he just stick to the positive stuff? All right. He says, Paul says, three years I was with you and I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. I've done all that I can. I'm not going to be here anymore. So I put you in God's hands. All right? I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. I wasn't in this for the money. All right. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. All right. You know that when I was among you, I had a job and I made my own money. All right. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So here, Paul is saying, I, I was an example to you of diligent hard work so that you would have the resources to share with those who are weak. And then we come to the conclusion in verse 36. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. So they all had a good cry together, uh, realizing that they would never see uh, the Apostle Paul again. And they accompanied him unto the ship. So now after this, Paul goes to Jerusalem. And unbeknownst to him, a delegation of the Jews from Ephesus goes to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem they stir up trouble for him, and the result is that Paul is arrested in Jerusalem. He is taken in custody and brought to the 
the, the coastal city of Caesarea, which is the seat of the Roman uh, governor. And uh, so he is in Caesarea, and for approximately two years, he is under confinement by the Romans in order to protect him from uh, those who were out to kill him. So Paul is under house arrest, at, if it, as you will, in the city of Caesarea. And then after two years, he is finally sent by ship off to Rome to be tried by Caesar. Right? Now, during the trip to Rome, they suffer a shipwreck, and the shipwreck makes the whole trip to Rome take a full year. Right? And then they finally get to Rome. So, the book of Ephesians is what we call a prison epistle, all right? It is, it is a letter that Paul writes from prison, all right? The other one is the book of Colossians is a prison epistle. The book of Philippians is a prison epistle. And the little book of Philemon is a prison epistle. So you have these certain letters of St. Paul that are prison epistles, and Ephesians is one of them. Now the question arises, where was Paul when he wrote this epistle? All right. He was either in prison in Rome, or he was in prison in Caesarea. In both of those places, he was under house arrest for about two years each. All right? So many people believe that Ephesians was written from Rome, and many people believe that it was written while he was under house arrest in, in Caesarea. All right? The difference would be the difference of about five years' time. All right? about five years' time. Anyway, so I'm going to assume for the rest of our study of the book of Ephesians that it was written shortly after his arrest in Jerusalem when he was in Caesarea and when all of the events of his ministry in Ephesus were still fresh in his mind. All right? And so Paul writes the letter to the Ephesians during the time of his Caesarean imprisonment. All right. So, now we can go to the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, and we can begin. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So we know who wrote this epistle because his name is the first thing that we see. Paul. And we know what Paul is. He is an apostle. The word apostle means a sent one. Someone who is chosen and sent to represent someone and to speak for someone. All right? And we might use the term delegate, right? A delegate. Right? But anyway, he is an apostle. Now, what does that mean for, for us? Well, an apostle was someone who was an incumbent of the office of the ministry. 
So Paul was a pastor. He was a preacher. He was a divinely called incumbent of the office of the ministry. But as an apostle, he, was, he had this difference, right? And that is that he was one of that chosen few whose doctrine formed the foundation upon which the church is built. All right? So Jesus told his disciples that the Holy Ghost would bring to their remembrance everything that I taught to you and that they would remind you of all things. In other words, Jesus was promising them that they would, by the Spirit of God, be able to rightly, purely, and truly preach and teach the pure Word of God as Jesus had taught them. And that the Spirit of God would would bring to their remembrance the things they needed to know, and that the Spirit of God would teach them and empower them so that they would not fall into error. All right? So there are these people whom we call apostles, and the Bible calls them apostles, whose doctrine forms the foundation of the Christian church. All other incumbents of the office of the ministry, such as myself, we are not apostles. There are no apostles in the modern world. Right? The, the ministry of the apostles was conducted in the first century, and the result of their work was the writing of the New Testament, the completion of of the revelation of God by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And now, in the Christian church, a called minister of God is one who teaches and preaches the Word of God that has been given to us by the Holy Spirit through the teaching of the apostles. So their ministry still affects us all the time. But there is no one among us today who can claim to be an apostle. We all stand upon their shoulders. We, we all teach the faith that the Holy Spirit delivered to them and empowered them to teach. And, and as we teach, we are always to teach in accord with what they taught. I see we are coming to an end, so let me just say something about the saints and the faithful in Ephesus. The word saints means holy ones. Right? Holy ones. How do you become holy? By faith in Jesus Christ. Your sins are wiped away and you are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And therefore, you are in the eyes of God a saint, a holy person of God. So, to the saints which are in Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, saints are faithful as well. Right? And, uh, and then he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is God's undeserved favor which He has toward you. All right? Grace is not some kind of a, a, a vitamin cocktail that God gives you to drink up. All right? Grace is not some kind of substance that He pours into your heart. Grace is His favor, His mercy, His love toward you. It, it moved Him to send His Son to the cross to pay for your sins. 
Grace is God's undeserved favor given to you. And peace is a descriptor of your relationship with God. God is no longer angry with you. God is no longer standing in wrath and judgment over you, as he is with unbelievers. But God is at peace with you, and you are at peace with God through the forgiveness of sins purchased and won for you by the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how in these two verses, everything is all about the work of God in His grace and mercy. Paul's apostleship is by the will of God. The Ephesians are saints and faithful by the work of God. And the gospel, the Christian faith, is all about the grace and peace which comes from God to us from, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful beginning. You know, we usually, when we see these, uh, these beginning uh, introductions to the epistles, we often read through them very quickly without stopping to note the fantastic stuff that is being said to us just in these words of instruction uh, of introduction. So next week we begin with verse 3, blessed be God. All right? So let's say the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you all for coming. Good to have you here today.